Good morning, I'm Ron Ferguson. I'm faculty co-director of Pathways to Prosperity and I want to welcome you here to what we hope will be uh, a really seminal event. Uh, when we first started to put this together and we were trying to describe what it was we were trying to do, somebody said, it sounds like you're going to have a pep rally. <clears throat> and I said, well, sort of, but we want it to be a pep rally and also a bit of a brain trust. Um, Bill Simons has been traveling the country for the last two years since we put this report out on Pathways to Prosperity in February of 2011, and the response was pretty overwhelming. I think he's been to 35 states, invitations from 35 states representing the project, and he has invited and identified to be invited lots of people who are really the experts at what we're going to be talking about today. And it's really a privilege to, to be in the room with this group of people. So we're really looking forward to what we're going to do here. Uh, Bob Schwartz is the faculty co-director uh, with me, and he could not be here today when we started to plan these things. It turned out that this was the best time for him to take a group of people to Switzerland for the <laughs> state network um, for pathways that they're working on with Jobs for the Future, and it was also the best time for us to do the conference. We decided instead of trying to juggle the times, we would just go on and do both. The, uh, Amy Lloyd, are you in the room? Okay, Amy Lloyd is the director, the staff director of the Pathways Network at Jobs for the Future, and she's going to be doing a presentation in one of the breakouts. Uh, which breakout is it you're going to be in? Uh, the Forging Effective Intermediary. So if you want to know more about the network, it'll be there. Um, So I should mention the states that are participating in the network are Tennessee, North Carolina, Missouri, Georgia, Illinois, California, Massachusetts, and Maine. Did I get them right? Ohio. And Ohio. <laughs> okay, and if you're more interested in it, in knowing more, uh, check with Amy. I think there's also a handout that will be around today. Um, before we go any further, though, I'd really like to thank the sponsors. We had 17 sponsors, I believe, who stepped up and helped us to, to make this event happen. Okay, that it actually works. <laughs> uh, and they're listed here, but just let me list them off. Uh, the New Options Project, ACT, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, when, I, when I finish reading the list, I'm going to ask folks that are affiliated <laughs> to stand up and be recognized. <laughs> uh, the DeVry Foundation, the Manpower Group, NCCER, Accenture, Microsoft, the Argosy Foundation, the Hegler Institute, and then we had a number of, of groups in Arizona that stepped up. The Arizona Community Foundation, the Arizona Department of Education, the Helios Foundation, the Rodell Foundation, the Sunt Found Construction, Sunt Construction, the Valley of the Sun United Way, West MEC Joint Technical Education District, and Whitman Foundation. So, uh, those of you who are here that are associated with any of those groups, please stand and be recognized. So again, we want to ex express our, our sincere thanks for that. Um, there are some additional housekeeping things that we need to do. First, just to remind folks to turn off your cell phones. Um, I turned mine off before I left my hotel room this morning. Uh, there's also a video release form in your packet. We are videoing all the sessions, and they will all, at some point in the not-too-distant future, be on the Internet to be viewed. Uh, there were lots of people who wanted to be here who could not be here. Also, none of us is going to be able to get to all the breakout sessions, and typically there are going to be two or three that we want to see at the same time. So those will all be uh, able, you'll be able to see those later. Um, so again, I think there's going to be somebody collecting them at one of the back doors as you go out. Also, um, we've got about twice as many people here as we had initially planned to have. And you'll see this room is crowded, and we got to the level at which we could fill this room, and we still had people who wanted to come. So we decided to open another room, and so there is another room that has a, a screen in there and audio, and there's some folks who uh, will be in that room for at least part of the time. Now, they're, they're down in the regatta bar. We also have, um, <laughs> there, but it's not a bar right now. 
<laughs> okay. On the back of your name tag, uh, well, let me see this, this first before I tell you this. Okay, we've got seats lining the wall over there for the folks that we didn't have uh, room for uh, around the tables. Now, we can accommodate folks along the wall during sessions like this when we don't have food at the table, but for the, particularly for the times we have food, if, you're, if the regatta bar is on the back of your name tag, then um, you're assigned to the other room. Okay, somebody has to be over there. <laughs> okay, and it'll be a really nice group of people over there. <laughs> okay, but, um, but for the plenaries like this, I think we can fit almost everybody in here and the audio and the two screens are actually in the other room and that'll work well. And um, the, the alternative to having a second room was to have fewer people and there were, other, there were folks that really wanted to be here and so we, we accommodated that. Um, and there are a few folks where on in the listing and you might want to not write this minute, but you want to check to be sure that your address, name and address are listed correctly in the attendees list. Um, we took this off of the registration and there were a few folks where the state that you're from, for example, might not be there. And we can edit those and, and fix those and get that information around later. Um, another topic. Um, this conference is very tightly scheduled. And so the most panels have, have a number of people on them. We're trying to have a lot of discussion in the breakouts, uh, not that much in the plenaries. But we really need to stay on time. If you're a speaker, uh, we really need to stay in time, on time. And here, when we do the plenaries, we've actually got a conference clock here. And it's got on it the amount of time that, that each speaker has been allotted. And when that time runs out, there's a loud buzzer. Okay, and everybody in the room will hear it. Okay, and I'm, I'll probably be sitting on the, on the um, far end over there so just to manage the clock and reset it and so on. But, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a short talk myself in a few minutes and I'm gonna put myself on the clock too. And if I run over, it's gonna buzz. Um, but I'm not gonna run over. All right. Let's see here, I think I've... Bill, is there anything I forgot to do? Okay, so let me shift gears now and um, start the clock on myself. <laughs> and All right, the issues that we're dealing with here are, as you know, issues that really change people's lives if we can get it right. And so it's really important the work that we're going to do. I want to start out with just mentioning uh, the relationship of, of this work to the College for All work. There are people in the College for All movement who are made very nervous by our agenda. They're afraid that we're going to take young people who should be going to get four-year college degrees and to get PhDs and send them to careers that require much less education. Um, People of color and folks who are advocates for lower income groups are especially concerned. Uh, you may have seen, I believe it was the front page of the New York Times yesterday, the article that, that pointed out that students from low income backgrounds, even who have the highest scores and the highest grades, are, unlike, are much less likely to go to four year colleges, and particularly the elite colleges, than are people from other backgrounds. So we've got to make it clear that, that our agenda is not in competition with College for All so much as it, as it is supplementary to College for All. If we doubled the percentage of young people who get four-year college degrees, we'd still have a third of our young people who need an alternative. And if we don't pay attention to the fact that not everybody's gonna go get a four-year college degree, we underdevelop the system for everybody else. And so here, we're really responding to the fact that we have underdeveloped the system more than we are to uh, any notion that lots of folks should go to get four-year college degrees. So I want to ask us to keep that balance, and I'm going to argue that more than anything else, this is about shaping the public's perception and understanding of these issues. This, these two days are very much about helping people to understand, to set a new course for the nation around these, and if we don't get the message right, it's just going to be messy, and we're going to burn up a lot of energy 
in needless debates. And so we've got to figure out how to get that balance right is one made point I want to make. The other main point is that this is about much more than just policy. We have national problems. People often say, well, what's the policy answer? And the answer is that there are things we need to do that require policy, but this is social movement work. This is about getting folks to sometimes do things that we cannot require them to do. <clears throat> we can't require them to do through any policy decision. We can't get them to do it by just putting out more money. It's about really national lifestyle. And we have to, to help people envision what that alternative national lifestyle might be. As you know, we're going through a major transformation in national identity right now. About 80% of the adults in the United States um, who are age 80 or over, more than 80% are white folks. But if you go down to the kids who are age five and younger, half of them are not. By the, before the middle of the century, we will be a majority nation of color. And we've got to be sure that children of color are world class in their achievement on, on multiple domains. And so it's about movement. I have a chart I often use that talks about the structure, the kinds of things we need to think about in order to get to, to really understand the movement in detail. Policy is the fourth line down in that chart. It's about the movement and then the goals of the movement and then the strategies inside the movement to achieve those goals. And then policy provides the resources and the authorizations to help us implement the strategies to achieve the goals inside the movement. So policy is instrumental in the context of bigger ideas about what we need to do. And then under policy, we've got the programs and projects that policy funds and the principles and practices that characterize what actually happens inside the programs. Okay, and so it's about movement and it's about really trying to, to frame that idea. The, this recognition that we need a movement is, is becoming pretty widespread now. The quote up here on the screen, um, Bill Shore, GlaxoSmithKline, we were at a conference together in 2011, and he said, it's a Sputnik moment. Communities are going to rise or fall depending upon whether they have a workforce. How many of you remember Sputnik? Or old enough. <laughs> it was a scary time, right? <laughs> okay, I won't stop to, to, to reminisce too much, but it was a scary time. Okay, okay. Uh, we, need to ha we need to stop having meetings and have a movement. He said, we've been meeting for 20 years on this stuff. We need a movement. And so we need to think about, and the title on this presentation here was Enlisting Hearts and Minds. Okay, it won't happen without hearts, and it won't happen without the minds piece. And it's a, it's a corny cliche, but when you look around where people get stuff done, they've got a drive that's undeniable. It, they're emotionally invested, and, they're in, and they really have thought it through. They got the, the intellectual piece done, and we need to get both of those pieces done. A uh, quote from Larry Summers. I worry most about what increased inequality and reduced opportunity will do to the, to the legitimacy of our system. Probably for the first time in American history, over the last generation, the gap between the prospects for the children of the well-off and the children of the less well-off has widened. I think there's going to be a need to re-legitimize public institutions starting from the public schools. So you could go through quotes from lots of different people who recognize this. Uh, Secretary Duncan was at the coming out party for this report in 2011. He said lots of similar things. Okay, so this work that we need to get done. And it's our families too. Okay, how many people in the, in the room have at least one child in your extended family for whom a four-year college degree is probably not the right answer? Just show of hands. Okay, me too. <laughs> okay, two brothers, a family of five boys, I have two brothers for whom it really would have been a good fit. Um, or some of the things we're talking about would have been a good fit. And I have one son at home. I raised three boys. Two are college graduates. The two is still trying to figure out exactly what fits. He's 20 years old. Okay, so this is not just about those other people's children. It's not just about poor people. Okay, it's about the nation and armies of young people. Even the fact that the percentage of those who do go to four-year colleges, the percentage who don't finish is really high. Particularly our less selective four-year colleges, I believe the number is about 37% who actually get a four-year college degree within six years, okay? So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, there's a 
I do a lot of work with schools. I'm also the, the faculty director of the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard, and we worry about cradle to career, so to speak, from, from birth on, on up. And when I go in and work to, with schools, I often use poems to, to get the ball rolling. And so there's a poem on the back side of the paper that was hand You don't need to read along with me, but I'll read it. It's on the back side of the paper that was on the table here, and it's called Searching for the Stairs. I wrote this on an airplane on the way to a conference on pathways in California <laughs> about a, eight months ago. I grew up pretty sure that someday I would go to college, but I tried, and college didn't work for me. Tried to make it work, but did so poorly in my studies that I had to leave the university. Now I don't know what to do, and time is passing by so quickly that I despair to contemplate my destiny. What am I supposed to do when everybody in my family went to college and has got a big degree? What am I supposed to do when everybody says that college is the only way to get where I should be? I'm asking you these things because they say that you're somebody. I'm asking you these things because I really need to know if there's some hope that I can find my own career. I'm asking you these things because they say that you're somebody who can help me push myself and persevere. Please help me find a way to keep believing I'm somebody other people can respect instead of fear. Please help me find a way to get invited to the party instead of being told to disappear. I thank you in advance for helping me to find a pathway. People say that you're someone who really cares. I thank you in advance for letting people in high places know that kids like me are searching for the stairs. This is a little chart I like to use sometime to characterize some of what I'm trying to express here. If you look at those three arrows up, A, B, and C, you can think of them as three people. And the things on the axis are skills or things you might achieve in life. And the little green arrow in the middle, the B one, is shorter than the other two in both directions. So it's easy to imagine that little arrow is the kid in the poem I just read, thinking everybody's better than me at everything. I'm just lost. There's no role for me in the world. But imagine that there's a point out there where that green dot is. And it's really important for the work in the world to get done that's out there at that green dot. Who's in the lead to get there? It's not the red arrow, it's not the blue arrow. It's the green arrow is in the lead. And we have to help our kids understand that everybody here, everybody's just got something you were put on earth to do. You gotta figure out what it is and then become the best you that you can be to achieve it. Okay, figure out what your green, what your dot is out in front of you, and if you don't give up and you keep going, we can all succeed at being what we were supposed to be. And whatever that thing is, there's nobody ahead of us. And so we don't need to worry about the competition, we just need to figure out what we need to get done and keep at it until we actually get it done. And I think that's um, the message we need to give to kids. I used to do this at orientation sometimes here at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And I'd have people come up during graduation and tell me this chart helped them get through grad school. Because they looked around and everybody seemed better prepared the first day. Everybody thinks, at Harvard thinks they had a mistake in the, in the admissions process. But, <laughs> right, so, so we just gotta get it done and not worry about what everybody else is doing or thinking. Now, one of our responsibilities in this movement is to frame the work so that other folks can see the place, so that they can see the coherence of it, so that they can believe it can actually get done. One of the pieces that we put together in preparation for the conference is what I just call a little draft call to action, and we can, we'll play with these ideas, and we'll come back to them at the end of the conference. But there are the first three things up here. What's the work that needs to get done? Well, initially, we need to cultivate a, the commitment. That's kind of the heart's part. We have to cultivate the commitment. Then we have to build capacity, build system capacity to live out the commitment. And then we need to use that capacity to supply opportunity. Most of what we want to talk about fits under those three headings. Okay? And when I talk about the commitment, particularly when, when, when we talk about the achievement gap work more generally, it's not just about closing gaps. It's about excellence with equity. It's about raising all groups to world-class standards 
and doing it in a way that ultimately somebody's race or ethnicity or social class origins give you nothing to go on if you're trying to guess how well they're going to do or where they're going to end up in life. Okay, so it's excellence with equity. And here, if we talk about the call to action, the idea of what we're trying to achieve here, the excellence notion is we want to commit to excellence throughout the pathway system. All the different roles that have to do with the balance we're trying to strike between the college and the uh, alternatives to that, every one of them needs to be excellent. And the excellence and the transparency is part of what's going to help us to persuade the people who are afraid of our agenda that we're really all on the same page here. Okay? If, we're, if we continue to provide less than excellent opportunities to the students who are not going to get four-year colleges, then maybe we deserve to get some flack. Right? So the excellence has got to be there. And then there are two dimensions of equity we want to emphasize. One is demographics, race, ethnicity, social class background. The other is equity across different career trajectories. Okay? We want to respect and honor and provide excellence and opportunity no matter what the kids' careers are. All work is honorable. Okay. So the career and the demographics. When I was about eight years old, I asked somebody, what do you do as a grown-up in order to make things better for people? I looked around in the neighborhood we were in. We were better off than some other folks. My father was a bus driver and a house painter, and there were other people who were unemployed and so on. And whoever I asked said city planning. Um, and I grew up to be, I got my PhD in economics from MIT, still on the same track. It wasn't city planning, but it was still the same purposes. And, but this morning I was thinking, thinking about it, and it occurred to me that almost anything somebody will pay you to do is making things better for people. Because if it wasn't, they wouldn't pay you to do it, right? So it's almost anything you choose to do in life that you do well will be making things better for people. And again, you just got to find your green dot, as I was saying. Now, on the building capacity side of this, we've got public officials, intermediaries, employers, education institutions, research organizations. And there's a little blurb after each of these things. I won't read them out right now. You've got it on the page there. But there are all these different institutions that are part of the bigger system. And none of them right now is quite what we want it to be in order to get the work done. And then under supplying opportunity, we want to think about the, the places where we actually meet kids face to face. And there, it's the teachers and the on-the-job supervisors when kids get first jobs. So many kids bomb out of their first job. We need the people who supervise kids in their first job to be almost like counselors and teachers who are committed to not letting them fail. Then there are the people whose title is counselors in schools and other institutions. Then we've got youth leaders. Dorothy Stoneman and others are, are helping young people around the country to organize and be and, and have a voice in the discourse here and to influence one another in positive ways. Then we've got the linkages between the institutions that serve kids that will help to break down the, the, um, the segmentation and facilitate smooth transitions in the system. And then community supports, which you kind of lump everything else, the parents and the friends and the other folks who care about kids and who want to be part of this. If anybody is familiar with Bromfenbrenner's social ecological framework, it talks about the macro, which is like the cultural blueprint, the system of beliefs and values that we're all in. And so that uh, cultivating commitment is really cultivating commitment in, in our macro ecology. Then there's the exo, which is the, are the places where decisions are made, where the kids are not important actors. They're often not there at all, but really important decisions are made that affect what goes on where the kids are. That's the, where we build a lot of the capacity here, or the places where the capacity building decisions are made, the public officials and intermediaries and employers and education institutions and research organizations. And then there's the micro and meso, which is the sites where the kids actually are right there and the interactions between those, and those are the things in the last part of that list. So I would submit to you that most of what we care about, we can kind of capture within what we have got here listed on the page. Now, I want to, um, I'm watching the clock here. I've got three minutes left. I'm not going to be able to say everything I plan to say, and that's going to happen to all of us today. <laughs> and so I'm going to end with uh, a poem, another poem that, that I wrote for, for high school principals high school teachers, actually, who get really impatient with a lot of the kinds of kids that, that we're concerned about here today. And it's called Hardships and Distractions. 
Gonna have my dinner at my grandma's house today. My mom's is staying late for work to make some extra pay. I got a lot of homework, but I'm worried about my mom, so that makes it hard to concentrate. My mind feels like a bomb. I've also got to make sure that I wash some clothes to wear, and I've got to get the stuff I need to tame my crazy hair. And while I'm doing that, I'll use the phone to make some calls to tell my friends the time and place for Friday at the mall. Sometime between now and then, I've got to get some dough, because I ain't going to the mall all destitute and poe. I know I should focus on that test I got in math, but my English papers do soon, too. I need some help, real bad. Some teachers think I just don't care. Some think I'm not trying. I think I'm caught in a trap. Sometimes I just start crying. But no one ever sees my tears because I just show the tough side. I like to seem real in control. If not book smart, then streetwise. I wish my teachers understood what it's like to be me, to see my life the way I do, the whole complexity. They see how hard it is to keep so many things in focus. They see how blurry things can get, how stuff can seem so hopeless. My teacher said I best to be ready when I take that test in math, but I ain't got no help at home. I never knew my dad. I want to go to college, but for that, I need good grades. And based on what my grades are now, there may not be a way. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need someone who's wise to help me figure out which way to turn, to empathize. Well, let me stop daydreaming because i got a lot to do. If I don't start my homework soon, I never will get through. If I try and still can't do it, well, just won't hand it in. But if I don't try, I'll never know, so here goes. I'll begin. Every day I pray to find someone to guide me and to care. Is there any chance that you could be the answer to my prayer? So we're all here today because we want to be the answer to that kid's prayer. It might be a girl, it might be a boy, it might be a Latina, it might be a white kid, it might be a Pacific Islander, we don't know. There are lots of kids in this position. And so we're going to join together, and by 4 o'clock tomorrow, we'll have figured it all out. Okay, so with that.